Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Will he want to go back? Hey, this is Kurt Angle, and welcome to the Kurt Angle Show. On the show today is a man that I truly pledge. He is a world champion, WrestleMania main eventer, Hall of Famer, and his name is Edge. That's right. We have the rated R superstar in our show today. But first, I want to introduce to you my co-host for today, filling in for Conrad Thompson, is none other than Paul Bromwell. How are you doing today, Paul? Kurt, I'm doing fantastic. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is an amazing opportunity, and I can't tell you how I'm excited I am for this episode, specifically with you and Edge at the same time. I can't be any more excited. Edge is here. Let's patch him in. Hey, Edge, how you doing, man? Glad to Kurt, have you on the Kurt Angle Show. Hey, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Everybody's good, you know. Um, we have a best, best friend from Syracuse is here this week with her family too. So we got four little girls running around. It's a madhouse. I'm totally outnumbered. There's so much estrogen, but I'm, I'm keeping my head above water. <laughs> well, I, I have four daughters. I know what you mean. So you, but, and you can't get away. See, no. at least only two of them are mine. So, but with all four of them, I realized like, this is a tornado that I am not going to be able to battle. Like the, I'm going to lose this one. So I just, like I'm in the laundry room right now doing this. That that's where I am. I'm You're sequestered in the laundry room. <laughs> that's all right. It's a great background. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's at least it's a good color. It's it's a nice green. Yes, it is. Oh, you can't tell it's green. It looks a little tan. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, listen, it's quite the honor to have you on with us, Edge. And by, by the way, you're no stranger to podcast yourself. How does it feel to be back on the other side of this? Um, I, I you know what I think? I have a little bit more of, a, of an understanding of what goes into it because of, of that. And um, it really did help me in terms of being interviewed as well, because I'd been on the other side of being interviewed so often that by the time, you know, Jay and I... Um, started doing the pod I, I felt pretty comfortable with uh also with the subject matter I mean it wasn't too far off the beaten path for us but it really it, it could be fun but it could also be like pulling teeth at times because you're depending on technology you're depending on a lot of different things and sometimes you get guests that give you one word answers and and that that can be pretty difficult luckily I get verbal diarrhea so you guys are stuck with me <laughs> So this show is going to be three hours long. <laughs> You're going to edit this one down. <laughs> All right. Hey, the more the better. 
Hey, anyway, I wanted to ask you this. You'd had such an amazing story of your career. And it's been well documented about you being in the crowd for WrestleMania six with Warrior versus Hulk. Did you ever think when you started that one day you'd be main eventing WrestleMania? You know, in my mind, yeah. And, and, uh, and I think I had to have that belief. You know, I, I think, honestly, I think everyone getting into this should have that belief. I, I mean, I think you also need some self-awareness and, and understand that there might be some things put in your path that might make that, you know, impossible. Like, I don't know, if, if your physical stature, whatever it is. I always believed that I checked enough of the boxes that I could get there, that that was my goal. And, um, and I had that, that self-belief to not accept the answers I was getting and just keep saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, until I could get there. Um, but I mean, you can't say, anything with 100% certainty in terms of wrestling because there's so much that goes into it there's so many different cards that need to be played there's a whole entire roster that needs to be taken care of and factored in and fit in some of that's out of your control but in my mind I, I pictured myself as a main eventer one day and you were <laughs> got there eventually there was some work <laughs> you helped me get there so oh thank you Ed. you helped yeah. me too it, hey, that's honestly, that's when magic happens. When, when you have two talents or four talents, if it's a tag team, whatever it is, that are in this thing together to try and help each other along. To me, the end result of every storyline, every program, every match should be both characters coming out stronger. And I understand sometimes scenarios, it, it, it might not be that both can can look as strong in the match i understand that but there's still a way to make a character look strong and losing whatever it is but in terms of a storyline I, I always like to think both characters can come out stronger than when they went in and and that should be the goal and i really truly feel like with both of us you were already cemented in the main event and and you were helped bringing me up what that did is it showed that i could hang and outside of a tag team, because I was, was kind of labeled as a tag team guy because Christian and I had so much success as a team that can be hard sometimes to break out of, you know, I know Brett had a, a challenge with that. Sean had a challenge with that. When you're in, in such a pivotal team, like the Hart foundation of the rockers, it can be hard to make your own way. And, um, and our program together, that was the first one where it was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm finding my groove here. And, you know, and I'm not just saying this because you have said it on other interviews and things like that, but you and I had a chemistry in there from the first match where it's just like, boom, we were locked in. And, and when you got that, that, that's a gift that you just, you ride that train as long as you can and hope at the end of it, okay, the next person you get, you can try to find the same thing with. I appreciate that, Edge. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, man. All true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> That's right. It is. Damn <laughs> true. Since, since you mentioned it and you're talking about early, early days with Kurt and working together, let's talk Team Wreck. I yeah. guess this is a question for both of you. How much fun did you guys have during this time in your career? I mean, my guy, you can see the smile on my face. You know, it's it, like I'm, I'm with my buddies, you know, because – we all rode together. We all like whether all four of us got in the same car, maybe not, because Rhino can be a bit of a thing. But um, <laughs> but uh, and, and you, link in the group. He uh, won't pay for a thing. <laughs> like we we'll, we get to tolls. Oh uh, oh uh, sorry guys. Uh, yeah, I, my wallet's in the trunk. Yeah, okay, Rhino. <laughs> um, but it really just such so much fun, you know. Um, when, when you can go out there and perform with guys that you consider friends that you have a chemistry with. Not only that too, uh, like a comedic chemistry, not just the wrestling chemistry, but also the character chemistry and, and, and the comedic timing. And then you throw Rhino into that mix as this kind of 
juggernaut <laughs> of a character who doesn't say much. I get it. It's a wrestling podcast, but he's saving us money on our mortgage. Do you really trust this process? The reviews don't lie. Five star review after five star review. We make it fast. We make it easy and it's no cost or obligation. Give us a shot to earn your business. I'm telling you, you'll be glad you did, especially if you like keeping more of your own money. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. So what are you waiting for? Hurry to save with Conrad.com. Like I'll never forget that one pre-tape where he says, I'll make them bleed for you, Kurt. And it was like, it's we all just kind of went. <laughs> you know, okay. it's crazy edge. His personality outside the ring is completely the opposite. Totally different. He's hilarious. He's funny. He's entertaining. He gets on TV. He just wants to be a psycho. Yeah. I'll bleed for you, Kurt. I just remember that, like your face and just stuff like that. And and then when we'd, we'd sit down with Brian, um, the words who was, who was uh, one of the writers for WWE and he got our sense of humor and we got his sense of humor. It really was just a bunch of different pieces that all got put together on this chessboard and we all knew where to move next. And it was, it was really, really fun time, you know, I think for all of us, but also just a fun time in the industry too, where you go out night after night and just hear those reactions of, Oh my God, like, this is so easy and so much fun. Well, we, we were family on the road, you know, yeah. we, we were on the road more than we were home. So that was our family. You know, you, Christian, me and Rhino, uh, we spent a lot of time together. We would kill time. We'd go to the movies, go eat, go to the gym. We just spent every minute together and uh, until we went to the arena and performed. But it was, yeah. it was an awesome group of guys. I really enjoyed it. And, and that, you know, that could be a tough thing because it's, it's that downtime, right? It's, it's the time between the shows. That's what you get paid for. It's the other, it's the other 23 hours. <laughs> and when you can find people that you connect with and that you can joke around with and, and that you can do those things with outside of the actual industry itself too, like you can go share a meal and, and, you know, just cut up with each other. It's, it makes the road, which can drive you crazy. It makes it tolerable. And when, when you can find those people, um that that it goes a long way you know and, and i've been lucky that i've had some, some really good riding partners over the years um that have just made 30 years in this industry uh you know a fun ride edge 30 years you've been on it 30 years so wow. technically my first match was a battle royal july 1st 1991 canada day 1991 but i don't necessarily count it because I was wearing Zubas, Converse, and it was a battle royal. I was wearing. Barely knew what you were doing. <laughs> nothing. I knew nothing. I knew enough to go over the top rope when it was my time to get eliminated. But the following year, at the same Canada Day celebration, I hadn't had a match in that year. I had the battle royal, and they said, "Okay, well, you got to keep training because you don't know what you're doing." And you know, I, I'd been training for I think all of four months before I was thrown in that battle royal. And then I trained for another year. So by the following year, they put me in a match, like a proper match. And, and that's what I kind of consider my, my first match, which was, was July 1st, 92. Yeah, yeah. Debut. Okay. Yeah, so 92 is when I debuted. And um, it, which sounds insane when I go in the locker room now and I'll be talking to someone, like, let's say it's uh, Mustafa Ali. And he's like- He wasn't oh, born yet. Yeah. yeah, I was like born in 90. <laughs> Uh, thanks man Appreciate that. <laughs> make yeah. you feel old yes <laughs> hey yeah you know in the wwf once you're put together you're gonna get split up and some point work against each other in 2002 you and i were put together on smackdown and our program ended in a hair versus hair match which you shaved me bald how did it feel to embarrass your olympic hero and give me the haircut i've had for the rest of my career <laughs> It has to feel good. <laughs> well, see, now I, I knew that I was just doing what mother nature was already intending. <laughs> okay. So I just sped the process up a little bit. <laughs> yes, you did. Here, here, here's what, number one, one of my favorite matches, just 
uh, it felt old school in that we're fighting over hair, right? Someone losing their hair. That's very like 1970s, 1980s wrestling feel. But what that does, it's such a simple story that everyone in that, it was in Nashville, everyone in that arena understood. There, there was nothing convoluted. There was nothing complicated. complicated yeah. Loser of this is getting their head shaved. And <laughs> right, right there, there and then. Yeah. That's it. Right. And and I, I think as a fan, you probably figure, ah, oh, it's probably gonna be Kurt. You know, they're they're probably not gonna do that to Edge's head, right? But we have them believing otherwise. And and to me, that's the ultimate testament of that match is we actually had people believing that this guy who's already losing his hair a little bit might actually win this thing and take it away from the guy who's got like a mop on his head. So, and is the baby face. We actually had them thinking the long haired baby face is going to lose the hair versus hair match. Yes, we so did. that, that to me, that was, it was just a blast. And when you can get in there and hear and feel the crowd like that, and also know you're with a guy who you're in the pocket with, you're in the zone with, like, we didn't have to, like, I knew the way you moved, what was, and, and I think vice versa. Like, I knew when you were going to pop the hips. I knew where to base off, you know, for that belly to belly over the top. To the Our floor. timing was perfect. It was just there, man. And, and again, when you find that, it, it's just, it becomes so much fun to go to work. Because, you know, once you get in there, like you are going to take these people on a ride. And then, you know, throughout the night, too, when we did all the backstage stuff and you're running away and hiding. And <laughs> and I know Brian came up with a lot of that stuff and it was just so much fun. He was fun. genius, yeah. Oh, and, and then me not knowing how to use a pair of clippers and just <laughs> you butchering your head. <laughs> just butchering you like I, i've seen it back and i'm like oh oh god i'm sorry like i'm still apologizing for that because uh, edge it was painful <laughs> <laughs> you didn't sell it hey, at all you didn't even move <laughs> do you remember do you remember the the prank that vince and i pulled on you before the show well it was so shane Shane all day is trying to convince me that i'm getting my head shaved getting my head shaved getting my head shaved and he will to this day He'll, he'll say that I bought it. Now, there might have been a percentage of me. It was like, this is, this is Vince and these guys. You never know. There is that possibility, but man, I, don't, I don't think so. Which just goes to show how much has changed. Like, we literally, I, I didn't find out what they actually wanted until, like, probably four in the afternoon. Later on today, <laughs> yeah, Vince held out. He wanted you to think that you were getting your head shaved. <laughs> and you know what? You came up to me and said, I don't know how I'm going to look with my head bald. Well, I know <laughs> what my head, head feels like. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't be pretty. It would, it would not be said. pretty. It, I, I kind of look like, remember that old vampire movie, Nosferatu? Yes. That, that might be me. <laughs> Yeah. That is one ugly looking me being, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I confuse people into thinking I might be a halfway decent looking guy just because of hair. Well, you are a good looking. <laughs> <laughs> just I don't, don't look know how close. you would look bald though. You're not gonna look okay. as good as this right here. No, that's a good bald head. You and Austin, you guys got you you guys were meant to be shaved bald. That's why we went bald early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, listen, it wasn't, unfortunately, it wasn't all fun and games, Edge, when you were in the ring with Kurt. You got hurt in one of the matches with him, right? You speared him from the top rope in the steel cage match, hurt your arm. Was was that a theme, getting hurt with the spear, looking back at it? That was my first injury, uh, was that cage match. We had, we had a cage match in Calgary. And, uh, man, I was so stoked. I was like, man, Calgary, Kurt and I cage match like mm. this is all the all the pieces are here you know we i think we had a two or three segment match it was you know um yeah, yeah. And, and Heyman had taken over his head writer and he pulled me aside and he said you know i, I want you to be my sting so i knew man I, i'm moving into like a top baby face spot right. here and 
we're going and man it was just such a fun vicious match right and and you know color the whole nine like it was just it was all there and we get to the finish and the idea was you got these two kind of bulls and they're both just going to charge and whatever happens happens right i'm on the top kurt's in the corner we charge so i hit the spear and it ended up kind of being almost a flying shoulder tackle really but in doing so i landed directly on my right elbow and that's mm, kind of, kind of shoulder up. yeah kind of coming down like a javelin right and boom and it kind of popped and i went oof i'd never torn anything to that point but i knew something was odd <laughs> so <laughs> you can see me roll over and cover and i'm kind of holding the arm close to me and then hogan comes down and we're posing and my arm's going clack clock every time uh -huh. i'm posing but i'm posing with hulk hogan so i'm gonna grind through you better this be thing. doing it yeah and uh sure enough i tore my labrum and you know nobody's fault it's just one of those things that happens you know i landed in a weird way because i was trying not to land on my head and uh that really started a snowball of things that you know because i never got the labrum fixed i just you know, I, I rehabbed it, I think, for six weeks and I came back. And then it was, I'm in a battle royal and I take a bump over and my arm gets caught and it completely dislocates the shoulder because I have no labrum to keep the shoulder in. And in doing so, I tear half my pec. I don't get that fixed. So then it just began. And now on that side, I got a fused wrist. I've torn this tricep. So I, I really point back to that first injury and not getting it fixed is it, it what i should have done is said okay right four to six months i just got to bite the bullet and do it but i've just been told i'm going to become the sting of this show so i i, I, I can't take be, six months off i don't want to be out with injury i understand right? that, that and we it, all we all get like that we get restless when we're at home yeah yeah and it just felt like the absolute worst timing to go get surgery right so but I can pinpoint back to that because, it, you know, and then I'd start to compensate and I bump a little differently and I bump a little higher. And now all of a sudden I'm developing neck issues and it, it just, it really snowballed. Um, and, and when I talk to younger talent now, when they say, Oh, you know, so I got this slight tear. I was like, get it fixed. Just get it fixed. It's not worth what could possibly happen in a snowball effect because you're trying to compensate now. Well, if, if you keep that snowball effect going, you're just going to keep going out with injury. You might yeah. as well get it fixed, get it over with, and get healthy again. Get it done, you know, and, and just, and it's never going to feel the way it did before, but it's going to feel a lot stronger than if you don't get it done. Well, you spoke of Paul Heyman before. We were part of the SmackDown 6 at that time that Paul Heyman was focusing on between myself, Chris Benoit, yourself, Rey Mysterio, Eddie, and Chavo Guerrero. Do you feel this was your biggest push, the first step to the upper echelon in the WWE? I mean, I really feel like our singles program was that, that first step. And then um, when we started that idea of the, the SmackDown tag titles, I knew with those six, with that six talent, and I'm sure Paul thought this as well. I can mix and match every week. Yes, and he did. And, and no matter what mix or match it is, they're gonna crush it. And five star, yeah. And and whether it's whether it's you know Eddie and Edge one week, and and Benoit and Ray, or you and Chavo, and then flip them the next week, and then flip them again, and then try the. I mean, there's so many scenarios you can go with. That to me. Um, that again so much fun you know i think back to like no mercy and that tag match we had for the the inaugural tournament and it was you and chris against me and ray oh, and it was a classic man it was just to to be in there with three other guys like that and and just performing at that level you know you, you can't really explain it, it, it it's hard to put into words when when stuff like that is just like, bam, bam, bam. And it's exactly how you envision it. And, and then some, um, there, there's a great sense of 
relief, but also like, I guess, pride because you go, damn, we just crushed that. And, and that was the feeling every night when we were going through that whole series. It was just like, you just knew going in. So you walk in with a sense of confidence that goes so far in making sure that the match will be good. Because if you walk in with that kind of confidence, it's pretty tough not to have a match like that. Well, you know, it's crazy. A lot of fans have rated that match one of the best tag matches of all time. And, you know, rightfully so. It's one of my top five favorite matches of all time. And I'm a singles wrestler. Yeah. The tag match. So well, and, a lot of pride in that match. Yeah. And I mean, everything's subjective, right? But like, that's one of those ones you can't deny, even if wherever you put it, you know, because it, it's it, it's art, right? So how, how do you... How do you rate art? But you can't help but say, no matter what, that, that was a hell of a match. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right, Edge. And thank you for the match. <laughs> no, man, it's, it's it was a recurring theme through that whole time, you know. And 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 then to also for Ray and I to click the way we did because we've never teamed before, you know. And I'm like a mad scientist, you know. So when you say Ray's going to be my partner immediately I start with ooh, okay we could do this what if we did that and then what if we did that and and then my my mad scientist brain starts doing these things and I go hey Ray what do you think if you rolled up and I got you in a power bomb but I flipped you in a moonsault on onto the floor onto those guys well, okay Ed Joe okay <laughs> <laughs> so your, your tag team intuition came into effect right yeah yeah, it, it really did. But then, you know, but I have a tag team partner who's Spider-Man. Yeah. So, so the, the laws, like, laws of gravity, <laughs> it's limitless now, yeah. you know, like if I think it, it can be done with Ray. And again, just another huge gift and, and, uh, and an instant chemistry with him, you know, as, as a tag team partner, it was, again, it was just the first night we teamed, I was like, oh man, we got something special here. And and we didn't team for long, you know, but it was just when we did, it was, it was there. How, uh, how amazing is it to still see Ray doing what he's doing at this age after the type of wrestling he's, he's performed over the years. I mean, it's truly incredible. Ray Mysterio, I mean, he gets credit, but it's still not the credit he no. deserves. It, it really is. And I think because he's been so, so consistent for so long that he's not appreciated to his full extent. And I don't know if he'll be fully appreciated until he retires. That's right. And I think that's when people will, when there's no Rey Mysterio on the show, they'll go, Oh, but wait, we, we need Ray. And I think as a writer, I think as a, as, as a company, I think as a fan, I think as a colleague, I, I, although I think colleagues and peers appreciate him more than anyone else because they truly fully grasp it and understand it. That dude for his style and what he's done to still even be in there at all, let alone at the level that he's performing at, he just did a hell in a cell with Roman Reigns. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the guy is, he, you know, the term legend is thrown around a lot. Dude's a legend. There is, he is a living legend and and one day people will fully fully latch on to exactly how special Rey Mysterio is well this is to be a little funny but he might be the smallest legend of all time <laughs> yeah well and so not there's that too yeah. think about all of the obstacles and hurdles that he, he has knocked down and how he changed an industry because without him I don't think Daniel Bryan breaks through you're probably right. Yeah, he was the first. You know what I mean? And, and a lot of talents like that. I think Ray Mysterio is the reason that could happen. He opened up the doors. He proved it. He proved it could work and people would buy it and people would pay to see it. He really did. Well, listen, Edge, you've done it all in the WWE. You continue to do it all in the WWE, but we got to talk about your TLC matches with you and Christian and the Dudleys. They stand out the most uh, since really that's when the company was at its peak in terms of the audience. They What do they talk about those and the impact those matches for you and your career? You know, it, uh, 
I mean, a massive impact um, in, in terms of putting us on the map. I also think a massive impact physically too, mm. you know? Um, so it's uh, a bit bittersweet maybe, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it was at a time where you had probably the most stacked locker room of all time. Okay. So you, you're looking at stone cold. You're looking at The Rock. You're looking at Taker. You're looking at Kane. You're looking at Triple H. You're looking at Kurt and Jericho and all these guys, right? Okay. How are you going to get noticed? And we happened to find four other guys, we being me and Jay, four other guys who had the same mentality. We'll try some things that have been, you know, the surface has been scratched, but we want to bowl up like we'll just rip it wide open and there's six of us there's not just two of us so we had a blank canvas with more paints in our palette and that that meant there were so many things that we could do that a singles ladder match couldn't do so you were seeing things that had never been done before and uh anytime you get that opportunity um I guess it can go one of two ways, but I'd like to think most of the time that's going to be pretty special. And, uh, and again, we found the, these two other teams at the Hardys and the Dudleys who, who wanted to do exactly the same thing, had the same mentality, who cared as much as we did. And the six of us would sit down and we would just, it, it was almost like, like, a, like a corporate war room we'd sit down and go, okay, how are we going to make sure that nobody can come near us? That was our goal. You crush the competition. And the competition was the rest of the dressing room. That's what we wanted. We wanted our match to be the one that you talked about. I get it. Austin, Rock, all those guys. Our goal was to try and top them. And I think that's a healthy thing. I think that's when a locker room is that's when a product is going to become what it was then because everybody was competing against each other. We're all working together, but the way we're working together is to try and put the best product on TV. And that's by competing against each other. And then that's made really, other, we made each other better. Yeah. Yeah. We pushed, we pushed each other and, and, um, and it was so talented that everybody could, could push each other, you know, and, and characters were so fleshed out and developed and um, it was a special time. It, it really, really was. And um, again, I think put us all on the map and, you know, for me personally, that spirit of Jeff Hardy, that's going to be played well after I'm gone. It certainly will. <laughs> the, the series of TLC matches are long remembered Edge. you're right. But what were your favorite programs during your career? outside of TLC matches and why did they always include me? <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. Well done. Well done. Well, but, but truthfully, um, as we talked about, I, I loved our program, you know, and I, I've said this before and again, it's not, I'm not just blowing smoke. I feel like that our program was the first program that got me going the direction I needed to go for me to realize, Oh, this is what I got to do. Got it. Because, man, when I first came in, I had no idea. I, you know, I'd wrestled for five years, but I didn't know character. I didn't know promos. I didn't know what to do with my hands at times. So I'd just go, ah, and scream. Like, I, I just, I had no character direction. No one else knew. I didn't know. So I'd dip into things I loved. And I'd, I'd use musical references and things like that to try and start to you know, put some kind of quilt together uh, of something. Um, and then the brood and then, but e even then, and then ENC, we found our groove there, but now, okay, I'm going from the top heel team to a singles baby face. It's a big transition. And complete opposite, complete opposite, yeah. complete opposite. And, and I was just keeping my head above water. Like my nose was probably above the water, barely. And then we started working. And that's when I started going, okay, 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 all right, here we go. And then from there, it's me and Eddie. And then from there, you know, little by little, I'd start to, to you know, gaining more and more traction. Um, so in terms of singles, you know, you, Eddie, 
uh, the, the, with Matt Hardy, with Jeff Hardy in a singles capacity, both of those guys. Again, the chemistry from our tag team days bled right over into our singles matches. You know, uh, I remember a cage match I had with Matt that I just loved, you know, and it was, he hit me with a leg drop off the top and just so much fun. And, uh, and then Cena, you know, and I think when, when Cena and I got to each other, we hit each other at just the right time. And he needed me and I needed him. And, and again, going back to that, when you have a program and you have two talents that can come out of this thing stronger on the back end of it, um, that that's the goal. And I think that's what happened with John and I. And then from there, I'm able to go into programs with Taker and, and then start to kind of carry SmackDown in terms of being a heel champion that the Batistas and the Canes and the Big Shows and the Undertakers and the Rays and the Jeff Hardys chase. Um, I, I've been really lucky that, that, you know, in parts of four decades now, I have worked everybody from Terry Funk to Jerry Lawler to Hacksaw Jim Duggan, mm -hmm. to Bad News Brown, to Rick Martel, to, to Ray Mysterio, to Undertaker, to Shawn Michaels, to Kurt Angle, to Eddie Grit. Like, it, it's insane the amount of people I've been in the ring with. And um, I've just been really lucky in that regard that throughout it, uh, I just tried to pick bits and pieces from, from everybody and, and always pick brains and always pay attention to the little things while you're in there. Um, there were nights, I, you know, before WWE, I was working out in Maritimes in Canada. And I found this out after, but Bad News Brown had, had chosen to work me. And when I found that out after the fact, years later, I was like, wow, what a compliment, you know, to, to be chosen by Bad News Brown to wrestle on these independent shows seven days a week. And we'd get in there, and we're wrestling through the Maritimes. They don't know who I am. So they'd boo me and they'd cheer Bad News and we'd call it on the fly and switch. And I'd work heel against Bad News Brown. You know, so all of those little things over the years and just try and pick and, and bring with me wherever I went. Experience definitely helps. Yeah, yeah, it really does. You know, you talk about all the wrestlers and that what a, what a list from Terry Funk all the way now through to what you're doing today. It's absolutely incredible. Angle, you know, Kurt Angle was talking earlier about, you know, why did they all include me, your favorite moments? What's that <laughs> one thing? What's that one thing that you'll remember about working with Kurt? Was there one item that maybe you took away from working with Kurt or always like, oh, I'm working with Kurt tonight? Uh, you know, there's something I'm always going to appreciate about his style or how he was in the ring, or maybe it was backstage. What's, what's something you think about when you think about Kurt Angle? Here's what I loved about Kurt. Kurt is the nicest guy in the world right? Like backstage, almost a wide-eyed innocence with Kurt. And, and I love that about Kurt. But you get in the ring and, and, and you are, are wrestling a Wolverine. You're wrestling a honey badger in there and you got to be ready to go. And your gas tank better be full because if it's not, you're going to get left in the dust. And I loved that. I appreciated that. I wanted that. So that was the thing I always knew going in. I was like, it's going to be awesome. And we're going to bust our asses, you know, like, it, it, and, and if you can't hang, it's going to show. And that to me is what I always really liked. Like, I like those challenges. I like, um, you know, and it was the same with Taker, you know, mm -hmm. with Taker's style and his size, you got to stay on him. Because if you don't stay on him and he's got a gas tank too, you're going to get buried. So alive, yeah. I didn't even mean that analogy, but yeah, but that was good. <laughs> it works. Uh, well, listen, you became the first money in the bank winner. The first one you defeated John Cena for the world title. You had a live sex show on TV. What was it about the heel edge character that you think changed the course of your career in 2005 and 2006? You know, for, for me, my goal as a heel, I truly wanted to be despised by 100% of that audience. That was my goal. I didn't want one person cheering me. And so I would try and, and present myself in a way that there were no redeeming qualities whatsoever. 
Like you couldn't say, oh, well, you know, he's got kind eyes. You know, it was, it was like, I wanted you to think that I was the worst, sleazy, maniacal, do anything to get to the top. That was really the, the, the mantra for Edge at that stage for the rated R superstar is all he cares about is a world title. That's it. And everything will be geared toward explaining that to the audience. And he will use Vicky Guerrero, in a, who's in a position of power, to get to the top. He will, whatever it is that he needs to do or whatever chess pieces he needs to move to get there, that's, that's what the character of Edge is going to do. And I hoped that in doing that, again, 100% of the audience would despise me. It didn't always work. You know, but for the most part, I think, I, for the most part, I think it did, you know, um, and, uh, and really, I wanted to be the Joker to John Cena's Batman, or Superman, actually, you know, or, or maybe Lex Luthor is a better analogy, but I really wanted to be that polar opposite to him, and, and be that Roddy Piper for his Hulk Hogan, and, um, that that became my 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 goal and then from there okay uh again back to smackdown and as the world champ on smackdown and all these huge baby faces chasing i tried to kind of take the rick flair mentality of that that backpedaling heel who could lose any night and that uh that was a lot of fun you know to to try and get the audience to believe that oh yeah edge could totally lose this like on a house show and it would be entirely believable um that that uh champ that's ripe for the picking kind of thing um so that was really the the mindset going into that and again i pull from musical resources so like i always thought you know edge during the the, the rated r with with lita and all of that it was kind of like the like guns and roses motley crew like yeah. that like oh what a what a sleazy bastard you know like that <laughs> kind of feel I love it you know um and and that that really was was where i was tapping into at that point and and i'll use movies and i'll use books and, and music a lot for reference mm. points like that well, you were the rated R superstar and you were really good at it. Did you enjoy it? At times, at times there, there was a time I definitely didn't, you know, and I, I think when everything with Matt and, and with Amy, I, I didn't enjoy any of that, 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 that was hard. Yeah, that and was really tough. Yeah. It, it was, you know, and it was a position that, that I put myself in. So I just thought, okay, well, I gotta, I made my bed. So I, I gotta just deal with this. And then I, thought okay well we're here now how can we pull positive let's make some money and 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 that's what we did is is really just try to okay this is the situation now let's try and and get something good out of this like pretty lousy scenario right and so that aspect of it wasn't fun but i think once i got to john now the matches were though strangely if that makes any sense, you know, because I loved working that. But um, then we, great chemistry. We we did. It was just there, right? And but when I got to John, and we kind of got on the same page, and re, and he realized what I was out to do, which was just that to make him Superman. And and once we both had that understanding, um, then we were we were off and running because I don't think that program was supposed to last more than three weeks. And um, after WrestleMania 22, and I, I got to work Mick, who is another guy that just did so much for my career. Um, then they, they circled back to John and I, because I think it had worked so good in that three weeks and ratings went up and all of those things, you know, the, the website hits and everything went through the roof. So it was like, go back to that. And then once they went back to us, I think we ran for like a year and a half after that, just night in, they night out. They rebooted the program, huh? Yeah, and then they'd reboot it again after, and they'd reboot it again, and we'd end up on SmackDown and be rebooted. And then, it, you know, it just it kept going and going and going. 
the only thing with with John and I, we never wrestled a one on one at WrestleMania, mm. right. which is Probably. crazy. Yeah. Which is crazy, you, right? You guys worked a lot together. We did. We worked everything else but. <laughs> and they say never say never. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, true. True. Yeah. I'm back. So That's knows? right. I heard he's coming back too. Yeah, I mean, it's the, 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 the scent is in the air. You never know. Could happen one day. I, I tell you what, from that mid-2000 point to 2010-11, it, it didn't get any better than Edge and John Cena back, back then in those days. So just great chemistry. And talk about your relationship behind the scenes with John. Did you guys got along? Did you talk through Matt? And what did that look like uh, during that period? Uh, John's very much a performer and uh, that, that likes to feel a crowd. You know, um, I, I kind of liken him to, to this is a strange example, but I liken him to Eddie Vedder and that Eddie Vedder will drop a set list for Pearl Jam, different one every night and change it on the fly because he's feeling the audience. And that's what John and I would do because you just you don't know from night to night what, a, what an audience is going to do. So to be able to think on your toes and, and be able to go with your gut out there that's what john and i did and that was fun um I, yeah i want to let everybody know how difficult that is to improvise while you're wrestling not very many wrestlers actually can do it and, and you're one of the very few that could you and john definitely it, it um it makes it fun because you know even as a performer you're like i don't know i don't know what i'm gonna do but once, once i feel them well, i'll do it <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so it, it it can feel spontaneous and eddie was the same way you know Ed, eddie really uh you know liked to to feel an audience but it, it, with, eddie was funny because he'd get mad sometimes when he couldn't feel them mm. you know and, and he'd get frustrated and then he, that he would had a temper to, he had a temper yeah and then that would lead into the match and you're like eddie calm down man it's, it's good <laughs> we're, we're gonna get him <laughs> it's the worst when eddie gets worked up in the ring you're right Oh my gosh. I did a lumberjack match with him once and he wasn't feeling good that night. And he was freaking out, just going crazy. I couldn't control him. It, it, Eddie, man. So like Eddie and I, um, not to get off topic or whatever, but Eddie was a guy that when I first worked him, I was like, Oh my God, this, we are gonna, oh, I can't wait. It was at SummerSlam in, in Long Island. You worked Ray that night. Still probably the strongest SummerSlam I can think of was that show that was 2002 um, right I think so I and mean, just like you and Ray opened it up and then you got you got me and, and Eddie I think you had RVD and Benoit you had Jericho and Flair you had it was stacked Brock and Rock you had I mean hmm. you had Sean and Triple H Sean coming back it's an embarrassment of riches that show um but I remember Eddie and I got to the back and we're like eh it was okay we, we both were like awesome <laughs> we're chasing perfection right and there's no such thing but that's what you're chasing so it wasn't until our third match together it was a no dq match on smackdown and we're like oh we got it this is this is what we were expecting this was the chemistry this was the match that when we both saw each other opposite each other on the sheet this is what we thought it would be and and uh but it wasn't that straight out of the gate one because we're both really hard on ourselves to try and chase this, that, that, that perfection that just isn't possible. Speaking of, of chemistry, Kurt and Conrad just had the opportunity recently to have Randy Orton on the show. And yeah. uh, one of my all time favorite tag teams was rated RKO. Rated RKO. <laughs> what was it about Randy that made you two such a great tag team? Well, we're friends, you know, um, and so even our, our program last year, a lot of what we were saying in our promos was just 100% true. I really did meet Randy in St. Louis with his dad. And I'm a huge Cowboy Bob Arden fan, always have been. I, I think he's just so damn good. And so I went up to meet Bob Orton because he's one of my guys. So I met Bob and then he said, this is my son, Randy. And I was like, and this kid's like six five. <laughs> he was a teenager too, right? Yeah, and he, and he's a good looking kid. And like, I went, "Hey, man, nice to meet you." And I did say, 
maybe some someday we'll get in there together. That's all true. And fast forward a few years and you know randy's one of the top heels on the show i'm one of the top heels on the show but we don't have a story and they said well what do you think about you two teaming we're like yep let's do it you know need somebody to work dx yeah that's us and and we rode together and we would you know i, I would kind of look out for him <laughs> and uh he needed a little help at the beginning <laughs> yes well, and I think Randy would also, this was also true too. It was, it was almost like in a way, cause I'm seven years older than Randy. So it was almost like a big brother thing. Mm. And, um, and, and I, in, in a good way though, you know, cause it, we, we, and we just worked well together. We knew as opponents that we had great chemistry again, like first night I worked and I was like, Oh damn, man, th this guy is great. And he's just, not even sniffing at where he's gonna be and and doesn't know it either that's the thing like doesn't know how damn good he is so by the time we got to teaming um we we were just we we're having fun because we we wanted to be those a-hole heels that everybody hated and then you put us in there with Roddy Piper and Ric Flair, and then we bludgeon them and take the titles, and then we're working DX, and it, it was a lot of fun, man. And and again, when you got chemistry with someone, the audience can sense it; they can see it, they can feel it. And for whatever reason, between Ray, between you know Christian, between Randy, heck, even with Hogan, like I've had great chemistry with my tag team partners. And uh, it, it, it just, it's a lot of fun. You know, I love tag team wrestling too. So I think that's part of it too. Well, you got great chemistry with everyone there. <laughs> so that's <laughs> just saying. <laughs> ah, well, thank you. But I don't know if I did, but. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, the WWE product evolved from the Attitude Era to the Ruthless Aggression Era to the PG Era. What area, what era was your favorite? I think you can find positives and negatives in all of them. You know, um, I think the Attitude Era, it was that spontaneous feel. Like you never knew it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it felt dangerous in a way. I, I, as a viewer, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to get in this next two hours, but I can't wait to see it. And I feel like characters were much more developed top to bottom. You know, from opening, right. opening match, main event. I've always said, Crash Hollywood come out, get a huge reaction. Steve Every, Austin come Everybody out, was a superstar back then. Everybody, everybody. And, and somewhere along the way, that got diluted. And the, the ruthless aggression, I feel, is, is kind of uh, the midway point where matches started to get longer and better. Because you go back to the Attitude Era, the matches were sometimes like two minutes long. Quick, yes. You, it you was know, more character development back then, and it was boom, boom, the boom, boom, boom. Era was all wrestling, yes. And and I personally, uh, as a performer, I, I'd rather be in a twenty-two minute match than a two-minute match. And and maybe that's dumb, honestly, <laughs> because it's harder on your body to do the twenty-two minute match. But as a performer every time I'm in a match, I want to tell a story. I want to paint that picture. And I can't do that in two minutes. That's a haiku. I, I want to tell a story. And um, now I think I, I look at like top to bottom and it feels like all the characters don't have an opportunity to get fleshed out. And I feel like it's very micromanaged. And I feel like some of the spontaneous freedom of that is lost and i feel like a, a lot of talent might probably feels handcuffed um but there's different things to answer to now you know you got a publicly traded company you're on fox you're on usa and there's big contracts and so i understand you can't swear on tv you can't do finger gestures you can't talk negatively about women yeah there's a it's, lot it's of stuff a going on. different set of rules and and it's a difficult road for talent nowadays um and, and, but I do feel that match quality is better and the athleticism 
there's no comparison. Oh, it jumped up dramatically. You're absolutely the, the, right. What what the the guys and girls are doing now? Like I watch Ricochet, and I'm like, <laughs> he's he's the greatest high flyer of all time. Like he can do stuff that I, I don't get. Like how do you how do you backflip from your knees to your feet? How do you do that? Almost like you know. Um, so I, I you know I I don't I don't know what the answer is really but i i do appreciate the different set of circumstances that talent have to try and get themselves over in nowadays because i think it's more difficult i really really do and having come back now and seeing it firsthand i'm like oh wow this is harder to to try and and present your story and present your character because the the format has changed due to necessity, due to those things that I talked about, publicly traded, yada, yada, yada. Do you feel like when you took the break after retirement, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, though, you did a, a lot of acting. Some of that training and things of that nature have helped you even now as you've come back in terms of, you know, just developing yourself as a character in this more difficult environment, as you described. Absolutely. And, and I think... When I say more difficult, I mean for people coming in the industry now or coming in the company now, you know, I, I have a body of work, so I don't have to go through those same challenges because they've seen it, they know it, and I can come in and I'm already established. So I, I'm talking, you know, from, a, you know, if I were starting out now, oh, man, and it was difficult when I started out back then, too. Yeah. But, um, be a lot more difficult now a lot more now a okay. lot more now so I feel for a lot of the young folks and I, I really do try and like just pick my brain man because I can I, I can't fully grasp what you're having to encounter because I'm not like at that stage in my career at the same time but I can at least give you some some guide you know some guidelines some some maybe some ten poles to you know at least help you feel like you're not drowning um but in terms of bringing the acting with me back after this nine years that I was, you know, forced to retire, it's helped immensely, you know, in terms of my promos, I, uh, I wanted to take some of the things that I'd learned on sets and, and bring them back with me. And cause I, I walked into acting. I didn't know what I was doing. It, it fell into my lap. It was a happy accident that, you know, I retired, I'd done one movie with WWE, right? And, and, but after that, I retired, I got the gig on Haven because they signed my retirement speech and they were all crying, thinking if this guy can get us to cry, we should get him on the show. They didn't know that I was like, just ad-libbing, ending my entire career that I've known my entire adult life. So it was all real. They didn't know that. <laughs> so I got the gig. <laughs> I got the gig on Haven, the gun. right? I, and then one, one episode, it turned into 41 episodes. And throughout it, I was studying and watching. And I'm, you know, wherever it is that I'm, I'm, I'm watching the, the DOP, I'm watching the grips, I'm watching the first AD, I'm asking other actors, like, okay, why, why'd you do that? Why'd you make that choice? And, and trying to peel back the layers of this thing. And then I started watching movies and TV shows the way I used to watch wrestling matches. And go okay why why did they do that or why did you know this that and the other and, and then oh so de niro studied you know for kate fear he studied cobras and then you watch it back and you realize he's kind of flared out the whole time ready to strike and I'm like, oh man okay that's some fun stuff um and i thought if i could bring that back to my promos that that would be instrumental in making them different than they were before because i want this incarnation of edge to be different and and be more traveled and been through some stuff you know the, the audience knows that adam let alone edge has been through some stuff mm -hmm. so let that out and and also find and i think this is the main thing i took from acting if i can find one element of truth and if in all of my characters, I can find one thing that Adam can relate to and make sense of, then the rest 
the fiction should follow suit if I have that one truth to bite onto, if that makes sense. Same with the wrestling promo. If I can lean into that truth, then the fiction of it should follow suit and feel real because of that. So, you know, I'm on Vikings. I'm playing this maniacal Viking who beheads people and puts their heads on poles while, while he's singing Viking hymns, right? How does Adam relate to that? And that's, that can be a challenge at times. Well, okay, Adam can relate to Shetel because his pregnant daughter was murdered. What would you do if anything happened to your family? That's all I got to bite into. And, and then I can take it and go from there. Same thing with my promos. That's why the promos with Randy, so much truth, it's going to feel real. It, it'll, those promos are going to feel different. They're going to hit different. They're going to hit way different than guys that are going out there being told what to say. Yeah. That, that neck injury occurs. You defend the title against Del Rio at 27. You retire a week later. You're going to jump into the acting that we just talked about. And everyone always asks you how, how it felt to retire. I want to ask, how did your body feel once you retired? Um, I didn't realize how sore I was, honestly, because when you're doing it night in, night out, you just kind of fall into this desensitized, like, you're, you're always kind of limping and you're always kind of bent over and you're always kind of like sideways or like the letter S, you know, as you walk, it just, <laughs> you get used to that. Right. Um, and it wasn't until I had the second neck surgery, which I didn't have until about 2012. And it was in Pittsburgh, Dr. Maroon. And I woke up in the hallway on the stretcher and Beth standing there and she goes, how do you feel? I was like, I don't have a headache. Mm. I don't have a headache. And the thing about it is that I didn't realize I had a headache for like a decade. Oh God. <laughs> until it was gone. Right. And I went, oh my, oh my God. I felt like shit. <laughs> but, I did, <laughs> but I did, but I didn't fully grasp it until that, you know, because for however long, I don't even know, my pressure was being pinched, my, my, the, the pressure on my cord, my spinal cord is being pinched like a straw. Right. So I'm working Batista and I'm working Kane and I'm working Undertaker and I'm taking choke slams and power bombs and all of these things. And I didn't grasp it until that second surgery. And from that point forward, man, life got so much so much happier, you know, and, and Beth will remind me too. She was like, we'd be out for two hours and you'd have to go get flat. Like you'd have to go lay down and just take that, that weight and pressure off. Um, and then from that point forward, I'm acting right. And, uh, you know, I'd have to do stunt scenes here or there or whatever. And they'd always use the excuse that they couldn't find a stunt double for me. So I was like, okay, well, I'll do it. And, um, so it, I'd end up doing it and I'm like, I feel great. Like I'm driving people through walls. I'm like, uh, you know, taking bumps on concrete floors during fight scenes and stuff. And I feel okay. And uh, wiping out my mountain bike. And then it finally, um, this is where everything just started that, to happen was uh, um, I wiped out my mountain bike when Seamus was up here. And I went, you know, I better go to a doctor and just find out exactly where I'm at for everyday life. And that was the goal, just to find out in terms of everyday life, what do I need to avoid? Because I didn't have a checkup from that surgery in 2012 until like 2018. And uh, went and had the checkup and he goes, hardware looks good, looks good, everything looks good. And that's where I went, so what about wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> you always want to go back to it. Well, because I didn't get to end it the way I wanted to, right? You know, I didn't get to end it on my terms and I know not everybody does, but if there was that small glimmer of opportunity to possibly do that, then man, you know, I always said I'd be retired by 40, right? Well, I had to retire when I was 37. So I didn't get that last three years of all the things that I wanted to try and do, which was really just try and teach. I wanted to get the dolls to Diglers and those guys and get in there with them to really like talk them through some things that they're hearing and experiencing so that they can take it and then give it to the next and to the next and the next. 
I wanted to be one of those guys Pay it forward to, to try and do that. Right. And, um, I don't feel like I ever fully got to do that. So I, I wanted to see if I could come back and finally do that. And, and, um, and here we are. <laughs> You're back at it, Edge. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting that three years now, basically, is what it boils down to. You know, now I'm doing it from 46 to like 49 or, or you know, whatever it ends up falling age wise that I didn't get from 37 to 40. Well, speaking of acting, I wanted to talk to you about the show Vikings as I've been watching it religiously. And I want to know, how did you get the part? I want to know where you shot it. And I want to know, how long did it take to get the accent right? And lastly, did you take anything from the set when you were done filming? <laughs> so, uh, it was my favorite show. Um, I, I've always been fascinated by Vikings. Um, and I, I just realized what hat I'm wearing, too, by the way. This is my local my hometown's local lacrosse team were called the Northmen. And I just realized I got a Viking on my head. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I've always been fascinated by the Viking sagas, you know, and, and, and um, I love the show. So I told my, my agents, my managers, I was like, listen, we got to keep our ear to the ground on this show because now that Haven's done, I'm, I'm open. I can, I can start reading for other shows and things like that now. So um, sure enough, a role came through and I got sent the audition and uh, I hired a, a, a language coach, a linguistic coach up in Toronto, just like an hour session and just said, okay, what, what are kind of the, the, the main things I need to bring with me here to be able to try and at least half-ass get this accent before I do this audition I know I'm not going to have it perfected but like if I can just get the main things so she gave me some pointers I went through on my audition and phonetically wrote everything out so that way I could start wrapping my mind around how to pronounce this properly as for instance like you don't say as you know s as a z no it's s let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. So it's hard S's it's, it's like, um, uh, God, it's not God. It's old. So it, it almost becomes a T on the end and that changes the O. And so did the audition um and then got the call that you know you got the role and it starts next week in dublin oh shit you start the accent right right and we got a six week old <sighs> shit so <laughs> we got lyric and now ruby's just been born and i gotta go to dublin and i can't even say when i know i'll be back it was just we need you you're in this season it's this season is 10 episodes. I didn't know schedule wise, like when am I, if I'll get like, I no clue. So flew out going, honey, even before that, I was like, I don't think I can take it, Beth. Like she goes, you, you got to take it. It's your dream job in terms of acting. Like this is the show that you always wanted to get on. You got it. You got to go to her credit. Cause with a six week old and a, a two and a half year old. A lot know, on Beth's plate. It's a lot on her plate, you know, and, and she, she, she pushed me in the direction mm. to, to do it. And I got over there and I quickly realized I'm not going to get home much. Okay. But if there were any gap, like if it were longer than three days, I would hop on that first flight. Dublin back to Charlotte, come home, then boom, I, even if I got home for a day and a half, I'd do it. I flew back and forth from Ireland over those two and a half years, 45 times wow. just to, just to be home. How, how long's that flight? It was eight hours from Dublin to Charlotte. And it was, it was always a red eye. 
you know, um, and uh, going over and then it'd be early morning coming back, but you'd gain that time. So, um, but it, it, it was, uh, it was a slog. That part of it was a slog and and being away from the family in Ireland was, uh, could be lonely at times, but at the same time, I also love Ireland. So I, I really, I tried to focus on, instead of focusing on how much I missed everything I was like okay I'm here I can sit in my condo and just miss the girls or I can go see some of the nooks and crannies of this country and and get into some of the history and and try and come away with something from it not only the dream gig aspect but also like in terms of experience um you know rather than just going back and and crying into my whiskey at night (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you talk about marrying you know, obviously you marry beth phoenix the kids and they talk about wrestlers and how they never get to see their kids growing up you just mentioned how busy you are with the acting gig but i'm sure there was a little bit more time to you for you to spend with the family how much did you cherish this time with your wife and kids the way it worked out for me and the way it worked out for beth uh for us it worked out perfectly because we got our yayas out. We 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 did our career. We we went for our dreams. We captured them. We did it. And then on the back end of that, we had kids. So I've been here besides Vikings and the backs and forths mm-hmm. and things like that. I'm home ninety five percent of the time, and and my girls know dad is always here. That's a great and that, thing, isn't it? It, it, oh, it's so huge, man. It like I, I can honestly say, like, my best job and the job that I'm best at is being dad. Awesome. And and it's the most important job. It's also the hardest job, you know. <laughs> it's so I, I'm so blessed. I'm so lucky. And and just the way everything worked out to be here and be the kind of dad that because I, I never met my dad, right? So to me, I always wanted to try and be the dad that I thought you should be. And so to be here and be so hands-on with them and to just, they're, they're so sick of me. Like I remind them every two minutes, love you, love you. And I'll be sneaking in a kiss and I'm like, Oh, oh God. I, I, but I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. You know, one day when they're 40, they're going to go, man, our dad told us he loved us like 58 times a day. Awesome. That's pretty cool. That's cool. And to be able to do that, the biggest gift in the world. And, and now to then have the thing I love second most in the world to come back into my life with wrestling, I, I'm, I am the luckiest guy on the planet. Like I got this thing back that I feel like I'm better at than any other thing in my life besides being dad. And now I get to be both. And, and I get to do it in a capacity that's different than the, the 220 shows a year grind that I used to do because physically, obviously I can't do that anymore. And, and I have limitations and I have, you know, I'm, I'm 47. Right. So, um, but just to, to have it back, to get in that locker room and feel the energy and just have fun with the, the guys, you know, like I walk in the locker room and it, it's, it's fun, you know, and I, I, I love, sitting down with you know Big E and, and Cesaro and just in Shinsuke and just all talking and having fun like it feels good to be one of the boys again and that was one of the things I really missed about it and uh so to get that and and now I'm gone like a day a day or two and I'm back home and I'm I'm dad the rest of the time and then okay you don't need edge for a few months okay just let me know when you need me again and then I'll be back you know it's it's a pretty pretty nice schedule to to focus be able to focus on all the important things in my life well that is the most important thing in the world your wife and kids that's what yeah. you need to do that's who you need to take care of yep yep yeah it uh they're priority one you know and but one thing i did learn and and i think we've had this you know beth and i have had this discussion is you also have to retain a sense of adam and beth It can't just be mom and dad, because if you're just mom and dad, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but I mean, if you're just mom and dad, 
and you lose Adam and Beth, then you're not going to be the best mom and dad because there's probably going to be some frustration. There's probably going to be some like, I got to do something and, and still tap into those creative things because we're all creatively minded if we're in this industry, right? So that's when I learned that taking the occasional acting gig or, you know, coming back for this limited run in wrestling. And I always want to be telling stories, whether that's writing children's books, whether that's, you know, taking a, a, a you know, a part on a TV show or a part in a movie or coming back to wrestle. I always want to be on the Kurt Angle show or being on the <laughs> Kurt Angle pod, telling stories, but truly just telling stories and, and, and trying to entertain. I think that as long as I can do those things and dip my toes into those things, I'm going to be a better dad. Well, listen, Edge, we appreciate all your time. We're going to wrap it up. I really See, I told thank you. you for being a guest on our show. I could fill four hours. Awesome. <laughs> I know. You know what? I'm trying to cut it short here because we're, <laughs> we've gone 10 minutes over. But, you know, I, I would love to do four hours with you. Can we have you back as a guest in the future? Of course. Yes. I'm, I'm always good. I'm always good to come back. No problems. Uh, uh, awesome. I, I miss you, brother. I really do. I, I miss, too, I miss seeing the boys on the road, too. Hopefully yeah. soon I'll be able to come on the road. Okay. Well, we'll be there. All right. Thank you, brother. Love you. Right. Can't thank Love you ya. enough for today, man. Appreciate it. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Take care guys. All right. Thanks, see Kurt. ya. Kurt, what'd you think of that, man? Another fantastic interview there with edge. Yeah. Edge is awesome. He, he's so uh, intelligent. Uh, his wording, the way he expresses himself. He's incredible. What a, what a great individual really is and so happy to be able to see that his career has been able to continue on you know you think of that massive injury the neck injury that kept him out for so long he's back and when this drops on the main feed kurt tonight's the big night for him money in the bank against roman reigns he's got a big match against roman reigns tonight that's right so oh. it's the same day as the kurt angle show <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yes. Love it, man. That's super cool. And uh, I couldn't be more thrilled to be a part of this. Listen, guys, if you want to check out the video, get to see that Viking hat that he talked about, you can. It's over at Ad Free Shows, where you get all the content here early and ad free. Kurt, great time with you today. Before we get out of here, though, I know we want to talk a little bit about those fantastic chicken snacks. Yes, I have the chicken snacks and the Snack Smart Organic Plant Protein. One's made of chicken breast, one's made of plant protein. They're high protein, low carbohydrate, incredible flavors. We got barbecue, we have sriracha, kung po, uh, cinnamon swirl. Uh, the kids love the cinnamon swirl. My favorite is um, buffalo wing and blue cheese. I mm. love that. And it's a very clean protein, but these are really good for you. They're incredible. And I want to thank everybody for uh, purchasing these. If you did already, if you haven't, give it a try. Go to physicallyfit.com and order yours today. That's right. Go to physicallyfit.com. You can use the 20% off code using angle pod, and that'll get you a 20% dis discount for that. And also Kurt, they can hit you up on KurtAnglebrand.com, right? For some autographs and other fun things. Yes. We got photographs, birthday cards. We have cowboy hats. We have milk cartons, uh, t-shirts. You go on KurtAnglebrand.com and uh, order yours. And if you want, if you have a, 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 a photo hanging around that you had that you took a picture of you and me and you want me to sign it, send it to the address with a small donation on the website and I will send it back to you uh, with a personalized message and signing. There you go. What I mean, that's fantastic service from Kurt Angle, the Olympic gold medalist. He'll sign it and send it back to you. It doesn't get any better than that, Kurt. No, it doesn't. I hope not. <laughs> it's true. It's damn true. Listen, you can follow our Olympic gold medalists at Real Kurt Angle on Twitter. And you can follow us here on the show on Twitter at The Angle Pod. We appreciate you listening. And this has been an absolute thrill ride to have Edge, again, a Hall of Famer, WWE Hall of Famer level uh, caliber talent. Uh, again, still getting it done in the ring. Uh, this has just been fantastic. A thrill ride for me, Kurt. I can't thank you enough for letting me be part of it. 
Oh, thanks for being a part of it, my friend. I appreciate it. All right. Well, listen, that's it for us this week. Again, join us next week for another Kurt Angle show. Have a fantastic day. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new contents. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.